Father, we come again with our Bibles open. Lord, we know that the, that man's best wisdom can be wrong, but we know that your word is always true. Lord, we know that, Father, we need to love you more, not because we are forced to, but because we want to know you and be compelled to love you for who you are more. We know that we so often lack faith and we don't live by faith. But Lord, the more we know you, the more we would know to trust you. So Lord, all these things, Father, we pray that you will help us to learn and to grow in as we study your word this morning. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so our passage this morning is Job chapter 19. Job chapter 19. We're jumping ahead a bit because um, just to uh, feel like we're moving a little more in the book of Job, and also the book of Job just has a pattern of accusations from Job's friends against Job and Job's response. And Job 19 is an example of Job's response to his friend's accusation. Of course, again, their accusation is that Job is suffering because Job has sinned. Job's suffering is proof that Job is a great sinner, and therefore God is repaying him eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Uh, It's a very uh, slot machine view of God. Uh, You put in this, this is what you get. Well, Job put in what he put in, and this is what he got from God. And now Job replies to one of his friends, Bildad, and basically the same accusation here in Job chapter 19. And as we look at Job 19, let me break it down for us first. Uh, There's three parts to this passage that we can look at. And notice uh, the way Job feels and what Job knows. Point number one, we're going to see. And I wrote it this way, it feels like God is totally against me. It feels like God is totally against me. Uh, Kimberly read for us the passage. It says in verse 11, he has kindled his wrath against me and counts me as his adversary. Job is saying, God, this is the way God is treating me. God is totally against me. Based on what I'm going through right now, it feels like God is against me, totally against me. This is what it feels like right now. Number two, we're going to see in the middle section of Job 19, it feels all have completely abandoned me. It feels all have completely abandoned me. And we see in verses 19, going on in the middle of the section, it starts going through all uh, these ones who should be by his side, my brothers, my relatives, my close friends. And it goes on to those who um, are with him. And it goes on even to his own wife, my intimate friends. What about all them? Well, they've all abandoned me. You notice Job's painful words here. God is against me. My friends have abandoned me. This is how I feel right now. But the passage ends with this. This is what I know. This is what I know. And it says that I know the one who will surely stand for me. You know, so often this is, this is how believers must live. This is how I feel. This is how I feel. But the, but the believer does not stop does not stay stuck with how I feel. The believer, the Christian, goes on to, this is what I know. And again, verse 25, for I know my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. I feel this way, I feel this way, but I know this to be true. As we look through this passage, passages like Psalm 42 may come to mind. Oh, this is how I feel, so cast down. But this is what I know. My God will save me. 
Um, one preacher said this, it's what we know to be true that determines if we will be able to stand when the sky crashes down on us. What we know to be true determines if we will be able to stand. If we, don't know, if we fail to know what, what, what Job knows, if we don't know these things, oh, when, when those things come, we can't stand. But it's what we know that determines if we can stand, and that's what Job has here. That's how Job responds here. This is a passage about what we must know to be true. Know, no matter how it feels, no matter how it seems, we must know certain things to be true. So I pray as we look through this passage today that God feeds us and God shows us precious truths in his word. Um, I pray that uh, this passage truly helps us to, to, to know more about what it means to trust in him and to live by faith and to be a believer, a Christian in this world, this fallen world. Let's look. We begin in verses 1 to 12. And again, the first point is it feels like God is totally against me. It feels like God is totally against me. Job feels a certain way, and it's, and, and it's, it's a painful feeling, and it's almost like this. What is more painful than the pain, the physical pain, the relational pain? What is more painful than the situation that Job is going through, all the suffering that he's going through? What is more painful than the actual pain that he's going through? Well, this the silence of God, the silence of God. Look with me at verse 7. Behold, I cry out, violence, but I am not answered. I, I call for help, but there is no justice. Job is saying, this is what's going on right now in my life. Not only am I going through all this suffering, all this suffering, but I cry out to, for help. I call out for help. And this is what's happening. Nothing. Silence. Oh, the silence of God can be a very painful thing. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever been in a situation where you are going through great suffering, going through great affliction, and in desperate need, you turn to God and you cry out to God in prayer for help? God, do you see? God, can you hear? God, please help. And it just feels like your words are evaporating into the air as soon as it leaves your lips. That's how Job feels right now. Psalm 28.1, the psalmist says, To you, O Yahweh, I call my rock. Be not deaf to me, lest if you be silent to me, I become like one of those who go down to the pit. He's, this psalmist is fearing deeply that God is deaf toward him, that God will be silent to him. Psalm 83, 1, O God, do not keep silence. Do not hold your peace or be still, O God. He's calling out to God, and he's saying, God, please do not keep being silent towards me, the silence of God. And again, Job 30, 20, I cry to you for help, and you do not answer me. I stand, and listen, you only look at me. See, what's so painful for Job isn't that he doesn't believe in God, that God doesn't exist anymore. He's calling out to God for help. And what, is, what does it say? You only look at me. Just his blankness. He just stares at Job while he suffers. He does nothing to help. He says nothing in response. Job is suffering. He's saying, God, help. God, please do something. And it says God is just looking at him. Just looking doing nothing. The silence of God can be a very frustrating thing. It can be a very painful thing, even more painful than the pain he's going through. Maybe some of you have experienced that before. Now, going on, we see Job is very frustrated. We see Job is so frustrated because he feels his pain he feels a, and he believes the source of his pain is none other than God himself. Notice in verses 8 to 12, the repetition of certain words. Verse 8, he has walled up my way so that I cannot pass. He has set darkness upon my paths. 
The reason why I can't get out of this struggle is because God is the one who has walled me in. He's trapped me in my sufferings. Verse 9, he has stripped me, uh, stripped from me my glory and taken the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side. I am gone. My hope has been pulled up like a tree. He has kindled his wrath against me and counts me as his adversary. His troops come on together. They have cast, on, uh, cast up their siege ramp against me and encamped around my tent. Notice in verse 12, Job is saying, this is what it feels like right now. Not only is God against me, God has sent his whole military his whole army to come and attack me. Imagine the whole military of the United States coming down against a single home. Well, Job is saying, it feels like God has sent his whole army against my tent. This is, this is way too much. And again, what makes it so, so, so painful for Job is Job believes in God. God is the one who is sovereign over all of this. And so Job says he has, he has, he has. The God, the one who is doing all of this in Job's life, is now the one who is completely silent to Job when Job cries out to him. Why? All this is coming to me. Why? And Job says God just stares at him and gives him nothing in response. Just silence. Well, this sounds very painful, and maybe some of you know this pain, the silence of God in the pain of all this, in the face of all this pain. But notice who isn't silent. Job is saying, God, you are completely silent, but notice who is not silent. Notice in verses 1 to 3, who is not silent at all. Then Job answered and said, How long will you torment me and break me in pieces with what? With words. Oh, his friends have many words. His friends are not silent. His friends are giving him many words. God is silent to him, but his friends are filling him with words. And they're not good words. They're words that are breaking Job into pieces. Notice verse 3. Ten times you have cast reproach upon me. Are you not ashamed to wrong me? When it says ten times, it's not saying you have said ten things to me. It's saying you have said things over and over and over again again to me. And they are breaking me to pieces. Notice, um, sometimes uh, people will say stick and stones. What? Uh, Your words can't hurt me. Right? Sick and st- um, words are not things that can actually hurt, right? Words cannot hurt. Words are just words. They can't actually cause me pain. Well, that's not true, right? Especially for someone who is going through great suffering. Here it says, your words are breaking me into pieces. Words can be very painful things. And his friends are filling him with words that are causing great pain upon pain. Now, uh, how, what do we do with this passage here in verses 1 to 12? The silence of God, the painful words of man, and the, the, the silence of God, uh, in addition to the pain that Job says is being, being brought upon me by God. Notice something about Job, and I've mentioned it before, That Job here in chapter 19, even though he is suffering greatly, even though he is crying out to God, Job is one who is still a believer in God. Job still believes in God. Even though Job feels like God is the one who is totally against him, even though Job feels, God, you are against me. But notice Job is still crying out to God in verse 7. He feels like God is against him, but Job is still crying out to him. At the same time, it says he has, he has, but Job is still crying out to him. God, he has done this. He has done this. But then Job still cries out to him for help. 
This is just what believers do. I mean, for Job, where else does he turn? And that's my, and isn't that true for us? Where else do we turn? But it's interesting here that the words of Job reflect his suffering. It reflects, it, it, it expresses pain and anger and doubt. It expresses all these painful emotions that he has. Well, that's, that's prayer. Prayer is something for all seasons. And we see that here in Job. It feels like God is totally against him. But going on, we find in the middle of the passage, in verse 13 to 22, Job feels like God is against him, but Job also feels like all have completely abandoned him. And we see this in beginning in verse 13. Um, one commentary writer wrote this, No human companionship, no fellowship, no helper who can take his side. He is utterly alone. Here we find Job not only is suffering in himself, he is also completely alone. He, his aloneness, the aloneness that he is struggling with. And we see him going on, describing all the ones who he would love to rely on, to stand with him, but they've abandoned him. Notice it's not just casual acquaintances. It's close, those who are supposed to be close to him. Verse 13, he has put my brothers far from me. Those who knew me are wholly estranged from me. My relatives have failed me. My close friends have forgotten me. My brothers, my relatives, my close friends, these are the ones who should be standing with me, but they're now gone. They've abandoned me. <clears throat> Notice in 15 and 16, he talks about the, the way that Job has lost the honor and respect of those who should be uh, around him. Verse 15, the guests in my house and my maidservants count me as a stranger. I have become a foreigner in their, in their eyes. I call to my servant, but he gives me no answer. I must plead with my mouth, with him, with my mouth for mercy. Even those who should be honoring him and respecting him have abandoned him. And now notice in verse 17, my breath is strange to my wife. I am a stench to the children of my own mother. Even young children despise me. When I rise, they talk against me. All my intimate friends abhor me. Those whom I loved have turned against me. It talks about his breath being strange to his wife. You know, there's different interpretations. Um, one interpretation is what we can imagine, his breath smelled bad to his wife. But the other interpretation is just simply Job breathing around his wife is a stench to her. He says, get away from me. Simply the nearness of him, breathing, is a stench to her. Job is simply saying, this is how I feel right now. I feel like God is against me totally against me. I feel like all people have completely abandoned me. In other words, Job is feeling the great pain of loneliness. There is no one who is by my side. There is no one who is standing with me. Do you see, I mean, verses 1 to 22, these are painful words. This is how Job feels. This is how he's feeling right now. <clears throat> you know, I read one author who talked, who, who talked about a, a certain way that we should respond to suffer, those who are suffering around us. And he basically said there's, there's certain kinds of suffering that are so painful that you just can't come and fix for them. All you can do is go and stand with them. And he talked about the ministry of presence. The ministry of presence. Job here is saying, all these ones who should be with me, they all have abandoned me. No one is by my side. 
The ministry of, we know about the ministry of the word, we know about the ministry of prayer, Acts 6, these are essential to the church. But one thing we should also keep in mind is that as a church, as Christians, we need to be aware of the ministry of presence. Job here, he just wants to have someone with him, standing by him, with him. Yeah, they're not going to come and fix his problems, but at least they're with him. But he has no one. That's how he feels. This author said the ministry of presence is the ministry of being there. Just being here. Being there. One pastor said this. He gave an example. Let's say a mother just lost a child and she's in great pain. This is a pain that you just can't go and fix for her. And this is a kind of pain that just changes someone. And he said, this is what you can do. Go to her house. Go wash her dishes. Go put the laundry in the wash. Pray over her and leave. And keep doing it until she is ready to talk. You're not fixing her problem. You're just standing there with her. And this is what Job said he wanted. Just be with me. Just someone to come and stand with me as I suffer. I am suffering here. You're not going to fix it for me, but at least you can stand here and bear it with me. And stand with me. 1 Corinthians 2, Paul talks about, I was with you in weakness and in fear and was trembling. The Apostle Paul was one who simply was with them. He was present with them. Galatians 6, 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Notice in this, past, in this verse here, Galatians 6, 2, it assumes a couple things. One, and it's that in this world we will have burdens. And the second, it's a call to go and help bear one another's burdens. This is a responsibility that Christians have, especially those in the body of Christ with one another. We are called to know that those around us, even if they have a smile on their face and they seem all right, to assume that in this world we all have burdens. You may not share it, but it's probably there. Even right now in this room, for you sitting there, you, have, you probably have burdens, even very heavy burdens. You may not tell people about it. We may not know about it, but it's probably there. This verse assumes in this world we will have burdens. And this passage calls us to go help bear one another's burdens. We need to help carry it. And that's what Job needed, just people by him. Uh, uh, a song that uh, I really like, an oldie, Stand By Me, right? Um, stand By Me, uh, just uh, some of the words, if the sky falls, the, the mountains crumble, I won't shed a tear as long as what? You stand by me. And that's what Job was longing for, people who would stand by him. And that's what we need to remember too. So, as we finish up now this passage in verses 23 to 29, and we see Job talk about what he knows. He says, I wish, I mean, I, 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 I feel certain things are true right now. I feel my God is totally against me. I feel all my friends and family, all those around me have completely abandoned me. This is how I feel right now. But he ends here with a statement of faith. This is what I know. And it's about what he knows about his, his Redeemer. And we see here, point number three, I know, I know the one. I know that one will surely stand for me. And it's about his Redeemer. Now first, notice with me, in verse 23. Verse 23 and 24, Job is responding to the accusation, saying that he has sinned greatly. And Job has a very long-distance view. Job is saying, I may not be able to prove that you are wrong, that I am not, in fact, suffering for my sin, that I am actually innocent and blameless of what you're, dis you're charging against me. He's saying, I may not be able to prove it now, but one day it will show. Look with me at verse 23. Oh, that my words were what? Were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in the book. It's ironic because it, 
is. Verse 24, oh, that an iron pen and lid and lead, they were engraved with an iron pen and lead, they were engraved in the rock forever. What Job is saying is, may my words here be written down in stone. These words about my innocence may be in stone. So even after I die and I'm gone, my words here will still testify of my innocence. What he's saying is, I may not be able to prove it now. I may not even be able to prove it in my lifetime. But I want my words to stand in stone because eventually time will tell. Eventually it will be shown to be true. Time will tell. But now we go to that very well-known passage in verse 25. Even better than having words in stone to testify about his innocence, there is one, there is one, there is a redeemer who will stand for me, stand with me, stand by me, and testify for me. Job is innocent. Look with me at 25. The one who will stand with Job For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. After my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Whom shall I see for myself? And my eyes shall behold, and not another. And he longs for this. My heart faints within me. This is what Job knows to be true. You know, we may wish certain things were true. We may wish for a world peace. We may wish that uh, the Lakers will be good again. We may wish certain things were true. But this is different. This is not wishing. This is knowing. Job says, this is what I know to be true. That my Redeemer will one day vindicate me. Now notice it says, my Redeemer lives. Meaning, my Redeemer is a living one. Uh, when, it, when, when this pastor talks about Redeemer, uh, we think about other passages in Scripture, such as Ruth and Boaz. Ruth and Boaz in the book of Ruth. We know that Ruth was one who, like Job, lost much. Lost much. She had nothing. And after losing it and being in desperate need, being helpless... Well, her Redeemer came and defended her and rescued her. That's a Redeemer. And here, what Job is saying is basically that, that, that one, the Redeemer, as Boaz was for Ruth, well, Job has a Redeemer too. This Redeemer is to Job, the one who will come and defend him after he has lost everything and rescue him and defend his cause The question here is this, who is this Redeemer? Who is this Redeemer? Listen to what this one writer said. Uh, Christopher Ash said this, who is this Redeemer that Job has in mind? Well, this Redeemer must be a very great one. Why? Ash says this, this Redeemer must live in an absolute sense. He must be able to stand for Job as what? An equal before God. This Redeemer must not be just any Redeemer. This Redeemer must be one who is able to stand for Job before God. Why? Who is the one who is against Job? He says, I feel God is against me. Then who is the one who is able and powerful enough to stand for Job and defend Job against the one who is against him? Well, this Redeemer must be able to stand before God must be able and powerful to defend Job against God. Another writer goes on to say, only God can save us from God. Um, A very great theological truth is that the gospel, what the gospel says is that God saved us from God. We are not saved from Satan. 
We are not saved from the world. We are not saved from an enemy who is so powerful that uh, we are uh, that 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 our Savior must save against them. No, ultimately we're saved from the wrath of God. Right? Ultimately, that is what we need salvation from. Who is the judge of our sins? We are we need salvation, and we must be saved, but not against another. We must be saved from God. The who can save us from God? Who is able and strong enough to save us from God? And of course, only God can save us from God, and that's who Christ is, and what Christ did on the cross, and the infinite value of His sacrifice. So who is this redeemer? Oh, Job is looking for a redeemer who can stand against God and only God can save from God. And of course, we know ultimately this is Christ. No, notice the passage also says, I know my redeemer lives and at the last he will stand upon the earth. At the last. This is talking about the day of judgment. Job is saying, they are, testif- they are accusing me of sin. Write it in stone. Let it be shown that I am not, I am, I am innocent. Well, here is saying, at the last, my Redeemer will stand with me and he will stand for me. At the day of judgment, my rede- I will not be standing just alone by myself before God, claiming my innocence. I will have one standing by my side, testifying for me, standing with me, defending my innocence. It says at the last, he will stand upon our, the earth. But notice here, when it says, I know that my Redeemer lives at the last, he will stand upon the earth. This is about the Savior, the Redeemer, who will stand with Job at the day of judgment and testify for him about his innocence. Stand with him, testifying for him that Job is, in fact, innocent. Here we find a very key word, this word to stand, to defend. It is to take a stand for someone, to testify for someone. And it's a word that we later on see more well fleshed out in the New Testament. And it's the word advocate, that we have an advocate who stands for us. Listen to 1 John 2. 1 John 2, 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have what? We have an advocate, one who will stand for us. We have an advocate with the Father. Who? Jesus Christ. And not just anything about him notice what it says about him jesus christ the righteous or the righteous one why does this passage want to show that the one standing and advocate being our advocate the one who is testifying for us is also the one who is truly the righteous one verse 2 going on in that passage he is the propitiation for our sins not only for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world meaning he took upon the whole the whole, the whole cup of God's wrath for us. He absorbed all of God's wrath for us, for our sins. This is what my sins deserve. God's wrath, he is a propitiation for our sins, meaning he absorbed all of God's wrath for us. Only God can save us from God, the wrath of God. And here it says, Jesus Christ the righteous. Listen to what the Puritan writer Matthew Henry says. Matthew Henry said this, the clients are guilty. The clients are guilty. Their innocence and legal righteousness cannot be pleaded. It is the advocate's own righteousness that he must plead for the criminals. This is the gospel here. What Christ does for us, standing with us at judgment, testifying for us, 
is not, look how righteous he is, Alex. It's no, look how righteous I am. And he is my body. That's why it says Jesus Christ, the righteous one who pleads for us based on his own righteousness. At judgment, Christ pleads for us not, look how good he is, look at Alex, look what he did, then look what Alex did not do, look how good he is, look how good his works are. But when Christ stands with me on a day of judgment, Christ says, look how good I am, my righteousness, and he is my body. That's justification. A good lawyer stands and defends his client. Look, look, innocent. But Christ says, look, innocent, look at me. Look at me. So it says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. God knows that we are not righteous enough for heaven, so God provided an advocate, a redeemer, to stand with Job, to stand with us. And here... Our Redeemer lives, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And as righteous as he is, we are. For we are in him, in Christ alone, by faith. So again, this morning, we saw what Job felt, and we saw what Job knows. He felt God is totally against him. He felt all have completely abandoned him. But this is what he knows, that his Redeemer will surely stand for him. And that's true for us, and that's what we must know, that we have a Redeemer who lives, who will surely stand for us and with us. Let's pray. Father, we again pray that uh, we may behold Christ and how he is so strong and able to save and that our faith will fully rest in Christ our Redeemer, and our Advocate. Father, thank you for these truths and these reminders that no matter how we feel in this world, this is what we know to be true, ultimately, that we do have this Redeemer who lives for us. So, Lord, we do pray that you will guide us into all these truths and strengthen us, Father, to live according to these truths. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.